without further ado, let's talk about what play is. And that might sound sort of, well, we all know what play is. But I have found that we know what it is, but we can't define it all that well. And in autism, we really need to. Uh, because there are some very important aspects of play that are not exactly second nature individuals with autism. Uh, play is, and we'll go over these uh, a little bit in detail, play is an intrinsically motivated, pleasurable, autotelic activity that in typical children requires no rewards or reinforcement. It's usually accompanied by positive affect and it is intimately related to the development of social behavior and communication. Now, that said, what is intrinsically motivated? Very simple. It comes from within. It's very hard to legislate play, even in neurotypical children, but especially in children with autism. So it has to be motivated from within. Autotelic activity means something valued for its own sake, like self-stimulatory behavior, right? You don't have to give reinforcements to children to self-stim. For whatever reason, whatever the self-stim is, it has meaning and importance to them. It's an autotelic activity. Well, so is play. And what we need to do is facilitate play in individuals with autism. Um, so, what are the competencies required in play? Well, the first is, of course, intrinsic motivation. It must come from within. Whoops, that came a little sooner. Oh no, it didn't. Meet my granddaughter, Grace. This is Grace when she was 18 months old. She's now four. Uh, we were playing peekaboo, a very spontaneous game of peekaboo uh, one summer where there was an L-shaped porch and she went running around and it, she only went to run around and when she came around the corner I said, peekaboo, and she quickly picked it right up and then we had a little back and forth turn taking exchange of peekaboo. But it was something that was obviously pleasurable to her and not legislated by me. Other competencies. You have to be capable of non-literal behavior. In other words, you have to uh, pretend as opposed to just stay rooted in the real world. And as we know, individuals with autism have a lot of trouble with this because they tend to be even more literal than I am. And I'm really very literal. Um, imagination is important, so you have to go into what is called an as-if mode. And you have to have cognitive flexibility. And these two, imagination and cognitive flexibility, are really uh, part and parcel of each other. In other words, if you go into an as-if mode and decide that a banana could substitute as a telephone, you have to be pretty cognitively flexible, not inflexible, to say, no, it's a really a banana, and therefore it cannot be a telephone, but it can be both. So how do you begin to uh, promote play skills development? The very first thing you do is follow the child's lead. And I could have said follow the individual's lead. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about a three-year-old, or eight-year-old, ten-year-old, or a fourteen-year-old. Follow the individual's lead in terms of what they value what they enjoy. If you know that an individual with autism is very into visual kinds of things, visual stims, looking at lights, uh, perhaps doing some finger flipping, I think, to change the light sequences, then you should try to build play activities around things that have some visual aspect to them rather than something that is auditory and vice versa if the interest is auditory. Now, you may not have known this, but this is very, very important. Play is intimately related to the development of social behavior and communication, and social behavior and communication is intimately related to the type and quality of play behavior. And that's why it is so important to do whatever we can to facilitate play behavior in individuals with ASD. Now, there is bad news, but it will be followed by good news. Because of the competencies that are required in play and the intimate relationship that play has with communication and social behavior, play neither comes easily to individuals 
with autism, or does it come naturally? Now that's okay, because there is something we can do about it. The good news is that research demonstrates that children with autism can learn to play. There is absolute research, research evidence out there, and I'll present one very important, very recent study, in fact, as recent as 2005. There are precursors, social cognitive precursors to play. And the reason you need to know this is that if they're not there, this is where we should begin. The first is joint attention. And joint attention is not just looking at the same thing at the same time someone else is looking at it. It is a true sharing of the experience, a true sharing of affect knowing that both of you are engaged in this joint attention activity. And you will see neurotypical children check back with the mom or the dad when they want to point something out in the environment um, that they want to share their interest and focus of attention with, well, this does not come naturally to individuals with autism spectrum disorders either, but it can be promoted. And research is clear on that as well. And that should come next, actually. And here it is. Um, Connie Kasari is an extremely well-respected researcher out of UCLA. And her objective in her study, and you don't have to have this study. This is, I want to give you a rationale. I don't want you to leave here thinking, well, play is a great idea, but it doesn't come naturally, and there's no research that really shows that it can be trained up. Well, there is. And you don't need to know the study, you just need to know that it's out there and what it really tells us. She decided to assess both the generalization and maintenance of newly learned skills in joint attention and play. So she did two things, joint attention, which is the precursor, and actual play behavior. And so she took 58 children with autism between the ages of three and four, and she randomized them to three different groups. One was a joint attention group, one was a play group, and one was a control group. And she only worked on this for five to six weeks, 30 minutes a day. And her results were quite remarkable. And when you consider five to six weeks for 30 minutes a day, can you imagine if you had a lot more time than that? Her results were the children who received the joint attention intervention initiated, not just followed along, but initiated more joint attention interactions with their mothers than the other children did. She also found that children in a symbolic play group initiated significantly more symbolic play acts with their mothers than the children in the other two groups. And what's absolutely remarkable is this. At the one year follow-up, with no intervening time uh, with no intervening training, <clears throat> or intermittent training. Children in the joint attention group increased their joint attention skills at a faster rate than did children in the other two groups who did not receive the joint attention intervention, and children in the play group increased their symbolic play skills at a faster rate than children in the other two groups. So this can be, all of these things can be trained up and that is extremely important and very good news. Her conclusion, children with autism can learn to initiate joint attention and symbolic play skills, and these skills can generalize to other people not involved in the original training, and they can be maintained over a long period of time. That's amazing. And it's hard research evidence from a very, very well-respected researcher in the field of autism.